At 7.15 a.m., Arden Bradshaw, an attorney in Wichita, Kansas, received a call from his 70-year-old uncle, Joe Owens, who lived oh, in I'm Seattle. Not really doing very well, Arden. I have to talk to you about a couple of things. The first thing that he told me was he had some things that he wanted well, me to take, to, to take care of. And he talked to me about his house and his car and things like things like that. And uh, he said he was going to be gone and he wanted me to take care of some of these things for him. Of course, I said, why do you need for me to take care of these things? And he said, well, I'm going to be gone for good. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, this is my last day alive. And uh, I, of course, asked him further what he meant about that. And he told me he was going to end his life. I haven't told anybody in the family. I didn't want them to know I've been diagnosed with incurable cancer, uh, prostate. Other things followed, but my immediate concern was that he was going to take his life. And so I, first of all, I said, Joe, let's stop this right now. I'm going to get on a plane and I'm going to come to Seattle this morning or this afternoon as quickly as I can. And before you do anything else, let's sit down and talk about this. His response was, no, I'm at the end of the line, and I'm going to do this. And I said, well, Joey, uh, if you've got cancer and you're going to take your own life, uh, uh, what does Gladys think about that? That's the other thing I need to talk to you about, Arden. Uh, Gladys is uh, gone. She, she passed away uh, back last March. He then went ahead and told me this. He said, I came home and found her dead on the bedroom floor from an overdose of barbiturates. And he said there were several pill bottles around that she had committed suicide, apparently from an overdose of barbiturates. Joe said he thought the family would be humiliated by his wife's suicide, so he had kept it a secret. He had buried Gladys quietly on family land at Mount Si, Washington. He said he planned to go to the same place to take his own life, and he adamantly refused his nephew's offer to fly immediately to Seattle. Goodbye, Joe. I love you. Thank you, Arden. I love you. Goodbye. After Arden Bradshaw notified the Seattle police, two detectives, Richard Steiner and Gene Ramirez, investigated. When we walked into the home, we fully expected to find Mr. Owen someplace in the house dead. covered every inch of Joe Owen's house, but they found no sign of him or of his wife, Gladys. Five days later, Joe's pickup truck surfaced at a masonry yard one mile from Mount Si, the same place Joe had told his nephew he planned to kill himself. Can you tell me the circumstances? Well, the gentleman came out and... Uh, the owner of the yard told police he had sold Joe a shovel, and, and his secretary had given Joe a ride to Mount Si in Joe's own pickup truck, which, incredibly, he had told her to keep. And I kept asking about how long it was going to be there, and he says, indefinitely. And I just thought that was kind of weird, and I just dropped him off and left him there and came back. Did he said how long he was going to be out on the mountain? No. Just about the place? This is where Lisa said she dropped the, the old man off. That's our last line walking right up the trail right here. You want to go to work? Where'd he go? You can find him. Where'd he go? Good boy. Where'd he go? Where'd he go? Find him. Police brought in five bloodhounds, one at a time, to the last place Joe was sighted. Each individual dog was sent up uh, with the scent from Mr. Owens' clothes, was sent up the trail uh, separately, not at the same time. They all went approximately the same distance, made the circle, and came right back to the main road where we were at. It would seem to, to us at that point that it was, it was inconceivable that Mr. Owens could have possibly gone any further up that trail. Well, gentlemen, that's five different dogs. It appeared that Joe Owens had not committed suicide, but police had no idea what had happened to him. The Joe Owens case was a puzzling one. In many ways, he appeared to be the model of a grieving husband, determined to reunite with his wife of 50 years by taking his own life. But when police began to look more closely, another image emerged. 
the disappearance of Joe and Gladys Owens began to take on the bizarre plot twists of an Alfred Hitchcock film. Joe Owens, at 70 years old, was comfortably retired and in good health, except for a hearing problem. No one knew exactly how much money he had made in his real estate business, but they thought it was a bundle. In retirement, Joe became obsessed with gardening. Joe was nine years younger than his wife, Gladys, and spent nearly all his time in the backyard. Gladys spent her time traveling to young pupils' homes to teach piano lessons. Joe and Gladys lived frugally, but by all accounts, the two led very separate lives. Joe? 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 I think that over the years, Gladys probably worked very hard at trying to please Joe. I think that she was very serious about making a life with him and making it pleasant. I think that the relationship probably deteriorated and got to where she was probably going her way, more or less, and, and Joe was pretty much going his way. And uh, I think it was uh, probably a very strange and strained relationship. Despite Joe's considerable fortune, the piano lessons provided Gladys her only spending money. Good. That's good. Okay, how are you, Katie? Fine. Let's start our lesson. Gladys was extremely popular, both with her students and with their parents. With the scales. Gladys was a very sweet, gentle old lady. She was your typical piano teacher that you would have thought your grandmother had back in the 20s. She always had a little rouge on her cheek, and she always smiled with the children, never raised her voice with the kids. That was very nice, sweetheart. Now let's start with our lesson. She cared about whether she could make it if it snowed. She cared about how the kids how the kids played, and she rewarded the children after they had their piano lessons. And it was a very favorable relationship both with us and with Gladys. On Tuesday, March 14, 1989, at 4 p.m., Gladys gave a regularly scheduled piano lesson to Gail Dunham's daughter, Katie. The next day, Tammy Decker, whose daughter also took lessons Hello. from Gladys, received a phone call from Joe Owens. Uh, Mr. Owens, oh yes. I'm calling for Mrs. Owens. Uh, she wanted me to call all of her students and uh, tell you that she won't be uh, teaching for a while. She's, she's had to go back to Kansas to care for her aged mother. Well, that's too bad. When will she be back? Because Gladys did indeed have a 100-year-old mother in Kansas, Joe's story seemed plausible. Okay, well, thank you. He called me about a week later to tell me that she was tied up trying to find three eight-hour duty nurses to watch her mother. And I thought that this was totally, totally believable, and, and uh, even though it was strange that he would keep calling me, I didn't think too much about it until weeks turned into two, three months, and still I hadn't heard from Gladys. During the spring months, while Joe told everyone Gladys was away in Kansas, he busied himself as usual with garden projects in the backyard. All the projects were in full view of his neighbors. He was digging in the morning, he was digging at night. These were not ordinary holes. They were too deep for one thing. But he said he wanted all that soil out. And he had to sift it. Too many rocks in there. It was hard to understand, but at the time, you just shrugged your shoulders, say that was just Joe's way. Soon, Joan Petrasic noticed that one of Joe's backyard projects, a compost box, had been dug to an unusual depth. Hi, Joe. I said to him, you don't need that size for a, a compost. And he said, well, look across the street. Your two trees and the neighbor's big trees. I want every one of those, every leaf that you've got. And I have to have it that size. Hey, hey, let's have a picture here. He wanted me to take pictures into Gladys. He was down in the compost seat. Thank you. I got double pictures for him because he wanted two. Then a week later, he said, do you have the negatives there?
Well, she always uh, had us prepay for our lessons, and I've prepaid for the whole month of March. After I'd Gladys like... had been gone for three months, Tammy Decker called Joe to ask for a refund on lessons her daughter had never received. Joe was infuriated by the request. I have her records here. There is no mistake in them. I don't find any prepayment. Look, if you have records that contradict my word, well, then you show me the records. I will be by your house. I will bring the records. I will show them to you, and we will compare notes. That's fine. Thank you. Bye. I have the checkbook here. I'll uh, make out the checkbook. A few days later, Joe came to Tammy's house and voluntarily wrote her a refund check. She couldn't understand his change of attitude. Joe had also changed his story about Gladys. He said she had gone to an arthritis clinic in Canada. That same day, Joe Owens also paid a call on Gail Dunham to give her a refund. He told Gail a very different story. That Gladys was out on the back roads of Kansas buying antique Nickelodeons with her 100-year-old mother who was much improved. Radical change. When is Gladys going to come back to Seattle and resume her music lessons? Well, <laughs> of course, she's coming back to Seattle. Seattle's her home. But music lessons, no. She won't resume music. His attitude then changed suddenly, and he began to rant and rave. She's had 37 years of music lessons. How can you expect her to teach music lessons when she can't even drive her car? He you hated her music. You didn't think that he disliked her traveling around. You knew that he hated the whole thing. If you played a note on that piano at that time, he would have, his whole body would have quivered. You know, you, you felt at that point that music, piano, her students, the whole thing with Gladys, Maybe he didn't like the mess in the house. I don't know. But you knew that there was a hate there. I don't know. I when Tammy Decker and Gail Dunham compared notes, they found that Joe's stories were wildly contradictory. They were worried about Gladys, but didn't know what to do. Soon Joe was busy having concrete poured into the middle of his backyard. His neighbors thought it was an odd spot for a patio, but Joe's yard projects had never been exactly typical. Finally, Gail and Tammy decided they should call the Seattle police to report Gladys Owens as a Seattle. missing person. Police department, missing persons. The mothers of the piano students were very important to the investigation. They were the first ones to notify the police department, and they are the ones that initiated the investigation. A Seattle police uh, investigator from the missing persons unit took a report and the next morning he confronted uh, Joe Owens at his residence. Well, are you two gentlemen Mr. Joseph Owens? Yeah, I am. Hi, I'm Detective Mark Ham from the Seattle Police Department. Yeah, what can I do for you? I uh, received a report that your wife is possibly missing. She's not missing? No. Look, I got uh, my contractor here. We. At that point, uh, Mr. Owens told him that he had all the things to do. He had a contractor in his backyard and told him to either return the next day or to call the next day, and he would give the phone number to him as to where his wife, Gladys Owens, was at that point. He told him that she was okay, that she was in British Columbia, and didn't have the phone number at hand. I made up my mind. Within hours of the officer's visit, Joe called his nephew Arden Bradshaw in Wichita for the story of Gladys's suicide and his own plan to kill himself. Let me be in peace. Let me do it my way. I... When the police went to Joe Owen's house, they noticed something peculiar. Now, this is all empty. All photographs of Joe, as well as his financial records, were missing. It now appeared that Gladys's disappearance might have involved foul play. Had Joe killed her? If so, what had he done with the body? Police thought that Joe's backyard seemed like a good place to start looking. Joe's neighbors pointed out the places they felt Gladys's body might be hidden. A demolition crew was brought in to uproot the oddly placed concrete patio. When the slab was raised, the crew began to dig. Finally, they reached a depth of seven feet. 
Nothing was there except dirt. It got to the point that we were about ready to leave the premises. Uh, we had done what we could, and there was nobody found. Uh, at that point, we decided to check one last place, uh, the compost box. He was seen in that area, and apparently he had made some comments to neighbors as to how nice his compost box was, that he was in love with his compost box. We started digging inside of the compost box. And after we lifted a false flooring that was placed in the compost box, uh, we found Gladys's body. She's in here. We've got a body in here. The first thing that we learned when the body was taken out of the compost box uh, was that her head was wrapped with a towel and duct tape that appeared quite suspicious to us. Uh, there was also some taping and another towel around her stomach area. The body was then removed to the medical examiner's office where an autopsy was performed. Uh, the autopsy revealed that she was shot with a small caliber handgun, 22 caliber. She was shot at the base of the skull and the rear portion of her skull. Joe Owens is known to own a 22. Police searched the house but found only a box for the gun. Then they found something unusual in Gladys's bedroom. She was in bed. She was. Although the sheets had been changed, one pillowcase remained with blood spattered on the back. The door to the bedroom had been meticulously scrubbed, but police found minute amounts of blood in the door's crevices. Yeah, I think we got, we got a sample here, I think. It looks like it's reacting. Okay. Evidence led the police to theorize that Joe may have killed Gladys at night while she was sleeping. They believe he carried her body through the narrow hallway and down the stairs, leaving blood on the door, then buried Gladys in the compost box. But I think it was a premeditated murder, and that he had planned this thing uh, at least a year or so in advance. Uh, I think that uh, the fact that he was seen uh, digging uh, a hole in the, in the compost area in January, when the ground was virtually frozen, uh, was a good indication that that uh, he had planned far far enough uh, to do away with Mrs. Owens. As a family member, I'm outraged, and I want him apprehended. I guess you might say in a, in a greater sense, as a member of the community, I, uh, I'm like everybody else. I want to feel that, that we live by a system of laws and that those laws will be enforced. And uh, people like Joe Owens and others need to know that. Only two photographs of Joe Owens have been found, his driver's license photo and one snapshot left behind in the house. Joe is five feet six inches tall and weighs 160 pounds. He wears glasses and has hearing aids in both ears. Authorities believe that Joe could have liquidated as much as a million dollars in the months before Gladys's murder, and that he may be living under an assumed name anywhere in North America. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Joe Owens, please contact the Seattle Police Department or call our toll-free number, 1-800-876-5353.